Talking Memphis Wrestling with Randy Hill and special guests. Hello everybody, Randy Hales, and here we are for Talking Memphis Wrestling. Talking Memphis Wrestling was born around five years ago with a mission statement to keep the legacy of Memphis Wrestling alive. We continue to do that as well as discussing modern wrestling, news, sports, and more. I'm Randy Hales. I created this here show, and I am thrilled to death with the growth and improvements of this show. Today, we are proud to debut a new gaming computer, which will improve the video and sound quality of the show as we continue our goal to make this show the best wrestling show on God's green earth. Today, we do a deep dive on one of the most important stories in the history of Memphis wrestling, the big split of 1977. Man, I'm excited. I hope you're excited. We are fired up and ready to go. A man that this new look of this show wouldn't have happened without my man, Pat Trammell, says, Randy, I need for you to improve your equipment. I'll help you with it. Randy, you need to start. He's been on me, folks. He's been on me. He said, you're going to have to start wearing suits and ties on this show. And then he comes in here and he's not wearing a tie. Chris is wearing his working out in the farm clothes. I don't know what's going on here. And we'll bring in to this show right now, Mr. Pat Trammell. Trammell, what? What is going on right here is we'll try to get you on the screen. Well, we're we're trying to class up the place a bit here and we're excited about the, the new uh the new look and uh you're you're starting to look like a proper host now, so we're pleased with that. I never saw Lance without a tie. But uh it's really a, a day to talk about new beginnings and, and I'll tell you you, you you're kind. But uh, you, you and and uh, Adam, we sp and I think some of our friends. I know Lance was, I think, and uh, Ronnie may have been on yesterday. We were test driving our new system here, and uh, th this is a this is just a really, really not necessarily new look, but a crisper look, and the video quality is just second to none. And I'm really, really excited to be a part of it, and, and thank you for uh thank you for uh all your hard work and all adam's hard work on this and and i enjoyed our test drive with our friends and want to say hello to al and richard and thomas and pj and ronnie and uh, so many of our other friends are on that i didn't get to uh but anyway andrew and bc and richard and uh uh, Deacon Mr. Terry and Tom Lamond and all our friends. Randy West is on, so we've got a uh, we got a great show coming and a uh, great, 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 better look coming. Now, what we'll do right now, because Michael's not getting the link, I got to send it to him. So you got to talk a few more minutes before we bring Chris in. So your first take of the show today, Pat Trammell, and we'll be back with Talking Memphis Wrestling after the conclusion and and Pat. Talk until you see me on the screen. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, that, that's the main thing I wanted to talk about today, but we're going to talk today about uh, probably the most important. Uh, yeah, that's a good, good point, Greg. We need to get some Baxter suits around here. Uh, you know, really the, the seminal moment in the history of, of Memphis wrestling was the split from the Goulas Welch, uh, Goulas Welch promotion in in uh, 1977 and somebody has asked us and i forget i can't follow oh, here it is richard who promoted birmingham in 77 uh, richard i was in birmingham i guess in 77 i grew up in birmingham and i'm here now 
and my first exposure to wrestling was on the Birmingham Inn, and uh, uh, Nick promoted it, and he was he was on about once a month. Uh, it was a 10:30 at night show. Sterling Brewer was the host. And uh, they wrestled every Monday night at the Batwell Auditorium. An, an interesting sidelight to how this all came about was, you know, the, the Memphis Territory did did spot shows pretty much every night, and sometimes, like all like all territories, in, in different towns, and sometimes you would do two towns two towns a night. Um, you know. Memphis was always an important market, and Birmingham was always an important market. But for whatever reason, they both ran the, their Coliseum shows. Memphis at the Mid South Coliseum, and Birmingham at Bowell Auditorium downtown. And actually, at that time, Chris, I don't think they were running the Mid South. I think they were running the Cook Convention Center, which is much smaller venue. Uh, Birmingham's Batwell Auditorium is about 5,500, and I think the Cook Convention Center was about the same. But they both ran on Monday nights, and and what that what that created over time after Jerry Jarrett really took over the booking duties in Memphis from from Roy Lee Welch is it created a competition between the two of them for talent. Um, you know, who was drawing the best money, who was having the better TV, all that. And ultimately, you know, in my opinion, it, it was on a collision course from day one for that very reason. And I, I, and when he was with us, I spent a couple of afternoons with Jerry Jarrett kind of talking through those, those days and how that came. And it was, you know, it really became a case of the tail wagging the dog. And, uh, we're going to talk about that some more under under Randy's direction, and I think uh, think he's back. And so, Randy, we were just talking about a little bit about what we're going to talk about today, and and I made the point, rightfully or wrongfully, that you know one of the things that one of the things that caused the split it was it was almost uh, destined to happen was that you know both both Birmingham and Memphis ran on Monday nights. And so there was a competition for talent. It was, you know, who was drawing more, who was getting the bigger crowd, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we'll, we'll get into that a little more. But, you know, it was just unique that, that, you know, two of the larger towns ran on the same night of the week. Michael St. John is in the backstage area. We'll go with Chris Ellis right now. And Chris is going to tell us his first take. Welcome back to the show, Mr. Ellis. Well, it's, glad, it's great to be back. I, I, I saw the joke about the Baxter suits while ago. Mine shined itself to death, so I don't have it on today. How about that? What's going on with you as a first take on a day for the first time in a long time? It's been a while. The state the, the has new... had a 20-game winning streak, and they're behind a little bit right now. Second half coming up. We'll keep you updated on that score. Hey, they've had a great year, so we're we're happy about that. I want to say hi to everybody. It's been a long time. The, the new look is awesome. It's fantastic. And I'm very excited about today's topic because I lived it. I remember the very first day of it. It's it's dear to my heart, so I'm very passionate about this today. Can't wait for us to do it. Looking at Ronnie talking to us and PJ and Jeremy and Mr. Terry Jones is in the house. A lot of people in the house. Our old boy from uh, Nettleton High School, class of 1989. Who do you think I'm talking about? Craigster. Yes. Craigster's on today. Craig Miller is watching. Pat Trammell, Chris Ellis in the house. Any other First comments you want to make before we bring in Michael San John? I don't know. I'm going to save mine for when we get on into the show. Yes. Yeah, so our subject, I, you know, I've had to go away. Pat, Michael, I guess I shouldn't uh, have sent that link early. I did it Saturday. And then I've sent you other link because Michael couldn't find the link either. And I sent him the same link that I sent you the other day and, and Chris and everybody else, Michael was just lost a little bit, but that's why you had to do the extended deal because I don't have a producer right now and I'm producing and I had to also do some emailing. Let's welcome to the 
the show right now, Michael St. John. First take, Michael St. John, of the debut on Talking Memphis Wrestling of the new stuff. I didn't get the memo that we're supposed to wear Baxter suits today. So I've got about three of them in the closet. Actually, I was in a coat and tie up until about an hour ago. I had three meetings in Huntsville and uh, all were important. So I had to have put a tie on today. But if I knew you guys were wearing ties, I could have made this a fashion contest. Well, I'm the only one wearing a tie. <laughs> I, I, I told the story. Pat was nice enough to help me with the new equipment. We have the gaming computer and everything else. And he said, now this BS show you've been doing, this cheap show you've been doing, you don't need to be coming in here in jeans and a dip in your mouth no more. You need to have a suit, a tie, and all that stuff because Lance Russell never saw him do that. But anyway, you guys are fine. As long as it – I don't – unless well, I won't even say that. I will say this. I don't want any of y'all naked on this show ever. That's against the rules. <laughs> Ain't got a problem on this end, I can assure you. Oh, well, I like my job. I think I won't do that. <laughs> I just want to say, and uh, and I had the uh, the great honor to have a, a a little bit of information in a part of the uh, setup for this new set, if you would. Uh, I think it looks great. And Randy, you look fab. You look, you really look fabulous tonight, man. That green shirt pops and that tie is fantastic. And co coach, you always look good. And, and Pat, I, you know, that, that, that button up look without the tie, that's, that's a pretty fancy uh, thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, a yeah, little... that's, that's pretty cool. Nicholas Oaks is saying this panel is the true four horsemen. <laughs> Nicholas, I appreciate that, but I think if you'd have said the four donkey men, I think you'd have been closer. <laughs> I'll, hey. I'll be I'll be armed. <laughs> Liza Johnson is here from Australia. Of course, we said Nicholas Oaks in the house. Brad Collins. We will see what Brad has to say. Hey, Michael. Hope the radio biz is treating you right. Michael, you can respond you. to that. Absolutely. It's doing well. We just crossed into uh, the time of year where it gets exciting again, and we get anticipatory over good weather. Good weather changes everything in the broadcast industry, and it even does it on the television side. So uh, thank you for that, and uh, uh, Godspeed. It's uh, so far so good. Uh, it, it gets busy, and that gets to be fun, and uh, that's what the game's all about. Al Tuttle is in the house from the state of Georgia, the Pete State of Georgia is in the house. Michael, you want to do your first take real quick? And if you want to involve Monday nights, because you posted about it on Twitter, if you want to talk, again, second week in a row, I'm telling you your first take. You can give your own first take if you want to. But first, talk about last night, and I watched every bit of it today, Monday Night Raw, and I think, and you made a comment, such as this, just about the WWE in general. Three hours of Monday Night Raw, watched every second on tape delay, but it reminds me, as good as it can get, as you have to go way back to the Attitude Era to find a show as good as we saw last night. I thought it was amazing, Michael. You know, sometimes in our business, in, in the broadcast business, you get a little complacent. And you get comfortable with the people around you because they're doing a good job. They're doing a great job in many cases. But in many cases, you know, the one thing that gets you in trouble is when repetition becomes just one of those things that it's just, it's boring. Repetition gets to be secondhand. It gets to be uh, nebulous. And so I think that's sort of what the trap the WWE fell into. I think they gave a concerted effort when AEW first signed on. They had a run of good shows, and then they said, ah, they're not competition. Let's go back to what we were doing. They may not have done that physically thinking that. That may have been just something in the back of their mind that just occurred. But I think once the UFC people got involved, the one thing that I really am excited about, and I'm seeing more and more of it on the show, is I feel like we're watching a sports show i feel like we're watching uh i.e baseball basketball hockey ba uh, football whatever i feel like we are watching an event that is professionally produced that is well lit that is extremely well you know the the formats to me remind me a lot of what 
when when Jarrett was hot in Memphis, those formats were tight. Those matches were tight. The people were in, in, involved and in, 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 in they bought into every event and every angle that was going on. And this is the first time I've seen that in the WWE. I know in 20 years, at least 20 years, maybe 25. But I really think they've got some hot angles going. I'll tell you, the the girls, uh, uh, Rhea Ripley and uh, Becky Lynch, to me, may steal the show. I mean, they, they when they got into it last night, I went, holy crap, they're fighting. And and I know the business. And, uh, and then I thought the finish last night when The Rock, when, when they went backstage, I just sort of nodded my head when, when, uh, uh, when, when, uh, 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 Rhodes uh, uh, took uh, took took uh, uh, the Uso boy that backstage. I went, uh huh. Rocky's gonna get him. He's gonna he's gonna be l- lurking in the in the wings, and he's gonna attack him. And by golly, when they did it, and the, I thought the cameraman was extremely whoever was on that uh, handheld was extremely good. And at the end, when they got the juice, damn, when's the last time you saw du- juice on Monday Night Raw? It was just, I thought it was one of the best shows they've produced in 25 years. We're putting a couple of the graphics up right now. And this is a big one on night number one. It will be Seth freaking Rollins, Cody Rhodes against The Rock and Roman Reigns. That is a first nighter. Also, second night there, and we will do, by the way, next Tuesday, we will spend part of next week's show as a preview for WrestleMania. How about this second? What did you think of how they built this match, Seth Rollins and Drew McIntyre? How do you think they did on that build last night? I I, I couldn't have done a better I couldn't have done a better setup. And then when McIntyre came in and interfered in the in the main event and everything, I mean that was just. And if you noticed, they they never ran too long on anything. I, I thought the the timing, you know, they gave people enough to where they wanted more, and then they dissipated, and then they gave them enough to, the, and then they went away at the end of the show with a cliffhanger. I mean, I, I think it's well done. I, and I do not think this is WWE people doing it. I think this is UFC people doing this. I think it is the person driving the ship is in creative. Most of creative is Triple H. I think Rock is driving the main event story and his personal writer who works for his company, Seven Bucks Promotion. I think he is writing all the Rock stuff and has a big part to do with the rest of the bloodline and Paul Heyman as well. So I think the main thing is that Vince is not there to veto it. I think that's the bottom line. Vince is not there because they had these smart people all along. I think what you're seeing with the the MMA people is like like selling the ring mat and and that sort of thing, bringing celebrities in. But as far I don't think there's so much. I don't think there's so much putting their hand in creative. I really don't. Well, I think what they've done is they put their hand in like when they're showing the boys dragging their their uh, suitcase behind them and they're coming into the arena and they're telling a little, little foreshadowing a story or getting people caught up on where they need to be on this angle, that angle, whatever the case may be. I think the interviews have gotten a lot better. I think they could get some better interviewers, but I think the interviews have gotten better the, because I like it when this is personal me, but I like it. If you're going to interview somebody, you have somebody asking questions, you have somebody answering questions. I think the soliloquies when the wrestlers get in the ring and do a face off or when the one gets in the ring and he's, you know, shooting a promo or doing a promo on somebody else. I don't think those are effective. I I really don't. I think people think of an interview or think of that that kind of thing when you've got somebody uh, like whoever you want to put in there, but somebody that has a modicum of success behind him, a modicum of, of creative, but also a, a modicum of people have trust in that person as an interviewer, then I think it gets over better. So I like the idea that uh, interviewers are starting to interview wrestlers. I really, really do. I, I sort of, that young girl that they've got working for her and she got the rock yesterday. I think she's got a lot of potential, but I, I think she's still, I, I don't think we're seeing her personality. And, and even if you're just asking a straight question, you can show personality through your expressions and your eyes and your face and, 
and that kind of thing. So again, I, I think they're doing a great job. I think they're on, I'm just thinking that this, uh, this, I just hope that, uh, that they, they've done such a great job building up to WrestleMania in Philadelphia. I just hope they don't lay an egg on anything. I hope that all the matches are quote unquote, five-star matches. But last night I thought the best, the, the one of the best segment segments of it was punk comes out and punk leans over and apparently punk and, uh, uh, the, the guy that's from ESPN's game college game day. I can never think of his name, but, um, McAfee, Pat McAfee, they apparently have had some rub in the past and punk leans over and he says, I don't listen to your show. I listened to the experience in the drive through and I just hit my, that hit my hot button. And I text Jimmy Cornette immediately. I said, he just put you over like Rover to use a Randy hailstone. Um, there's my hey, Joshua. He's How here, you doing, buddy. He, he heard he was going to be on TV. Say hello to everybody. Hey, Joshua. All uh, right. He, City but, by the Bay, City by the Bay, Nicholas Oak says, question for Michael, what sleeper team or player could – should baseball fans look out for this season? Ooh, that's a good question. There are, there are a couple of guys I've seen in spring training. Uh, this uh, Todd Benson or the Benson uh, outfielder for the Reds is looking pretty good. Yes, sir. Al Tuttle says, do you guys think what some are th saying that Rock is overshadowing Roman and Cody? Mm -hmm. Well, here's the thing. Absolutely. Rock would not be over if he was not able to come into a story that was already over. I think people don't understand that. Yes, he added to it, made it bigger. He's the biggest dead gum freaking star on the face of the planet. But as far as overshadowing everybody else, no, I don't buy that at all. I think they would have still done a great number. I think people would still be calling. I think the fact right now is to the last year, Cody's been uh, elevated so much, but since Rock's been there about 10 times more, did you see that reaction of Cody Rhodes yesterday? It was absolutely amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Amazing. I'm trying to keep up right now with everybody talking. Alexander says, hi, everybody. Says that twice. David Linville, hello from Maysville, Kentucky. Laza, good day from Australia. Thomas Leonard says, hi to Joshua. Ryan he, wanted, Crowder, he wanted his chocolate bunny, so now you got a piece of his chocolate bunny. He's run out of here for a minute. Well, I like that. Yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> says the best thing that happened to WWE universe and we're not going to even talk about that no use that era is over so I'm not going to mention that and let's see what's going on what else, who else is talking to us Pat Mike says love the show as always well I, you know I wanted I was thinking about something and I can't can't slip it down like I want to we got a lot of our, our old friends on and uh, we've got a lot of new friends on. I mean, now when there were six of us, we could put six, six guests back in the old days. We could pretty go have a ongoing running conversation. But we've got a uh, we've got a lot of a uh, lot of folks coming on and uh, big, big crowd tonight for the uh, debut of the new new studio set and uh, the new technology, including one of one of my heroes, Randy Balk is with us tonight. One of my right. favorite. Mucky, this is Talking Memphis Wrestling. Right now, for just a few more minutes, we're going to do a couple of more questions. Al Tuttle says Roman Reigns' biography is this Sunday on A N and E, and Paul Heyman produced the whole thing. And Paul, there's no doubt about it, is a brilliant, brilliant creative guy and a producer. And I think that is just absolutely great. And we have Carlton Steve Robb from Princeton, Alabama. Michael? Indiana. Indiana. I think it's Indiana, Randy. Okay, y'all do the show. <laughs> oh. uh, no, he, he, he does. It does say Indiana up there.
the subject of the day today. I think as I slid off this show to talk about is the most important story in the history of Memphis wrestling. So excited to talk about it for sure. Michael, do you have your notes? I do. And they are right here. And, uh, you're right. I think this, this probably changed the landscape of professional wrestling in the South more so than any other event in history. First of all, we'll get people up to date and I do a little background and talk and set up what Michael is going to read. And then Pat Trammell is going to do some reading. And then Chris Ellis has three cards coming up. So we look forward to that as well. The power brokers of National Chattanooga, of the whole Gulas Welch Wrestling Company, were these three people. Christine Jarrett, Nick Gulas, and Roy Welch. Roy Welch originated wrestling in Tennessee. He brought in Nick Gulas, and then later on, Christine Jarrett came in the fold, and it became another ball game then. Then, in around 1969, Roy was running Memphis. Nick was doing Chattanooga. Nick had Birmingham and Nashville. Jerry Jarrett was hired 68 or 69 to be the booker. Eventually, Jerry went and got Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. And let's take a look at a very young-looking Jerry Jarrett there. Man, how does he look in that picture Look like a, for sure, a young man. Now, Roy took him underneath his ring wing and taught him booking. Here is a picture of Roy Welch, of Nick Goulas, and this is Roy Welch's son, Ed. We all know him as Buddy Fuller. They will all work together for a long, long time. And then there was an absolute split in the two companies because Jerry Jarrett thought, and we'll get into this with Michael's article, Jerry Jarrett thought he was buying it into the company. Nick wanted Jerry to book George. Jerry said no. Nick did a power play. When it came down to the point, Jerry Jarrett in February of 1977 resigned from Gulas Welch Wrestling, Memphis Wrestling Enterprises, and immediately Channel 13 canceled the television, and Jerry Jarrett went out and looked for a new television station, and we'll get dates and and all that uh, coming up, and that's the setup for it as well and again this history that we know of memphis wrestling this is when it changed this is is absolutely when it changed 110 percent now we're going to go but first of all before we go with michael to read that article and michael do some pauses after big subjects so we can discuss and um, before we go to Michael, Chris or Pat, do you have anything, anything else to say right now? No, I'm just excited to get into this topic. As you say, this is probably, well, it, it has to be the most important moment in Memphis wrestling history. And, and I think we'll learn as we go through this, it could, it could have gone a lot of different ways from here. Well, if you look, I think I think as long as Jerry Jarrett had Jerry Lawler, if the only thing different that would have happened if if Jarrett would have stayed, you know, then it would have kind of stayed the same. But I think Jerry was so ambitious sounds like a bad word, but it, he didn't need to be just the employee. He needed to be the person that ran the whole thing. And I think the history after that proves the fact, and I want to put that article up there. I know you can't read it, but this is the Memphis Commercial Appeal, and I'll ask Michael this question. Front page of the Memphis Commercial Appeal, the first 
article is tug of war is on for memphis wrestling and then the second article down at the bottom if fans and lawler responds to announcer lance russell bowing out you know for that to be in a front page of a sports section is unbelievable and then we'll turn it over to michael st john well thank you randy just one more just quick a uh, little bit of history on that uh back in the day before the split you were mentioning roy running running memphis nick didn't like to go to memphis uh, he thought it was too far of a drive. He couldn't get back home at a decent hour. So he always, he, he, and, and I think Roy liked Memphis for whatever reason, maybe because it was the biggest city in the territory, but there hey, was, let me, let me interrupt you real quick. First of all, one of the two, there was two major towns running, as you said, on Monday night. So, so Nick wanted to go to Birmingham and then Roy lived around Dyersburg, Tennessee. So it was a lot quicker for Roy to drive to Memphis and drive to Birmingham back in those days, two lane roads. That's right. 78 from Memphis to Birmingham was a four, four and a half hour trip at best. And it was a horrible road. You're right about that. But anyway, that's just a little background, but, uh, the big thing of course occurred in, uh, in, uh, March of 1977 foreshadowed by Jerry Jarrett, leaving Nick Gullis's company. Jerry thought he had bought into the company and had been paying Nick. Uh, uh, I had heard up to $50,000 when it uh, came to the time that Jerry wanted to exercise his part because of, of Roy going into uh, 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 elderly care. Uh, Nick told him, no, you bought an option to buy into the company. And that's what started the, the war. But uh, the, the commercial appeal article was written by Joel Baring uh, on March 20th of 1977. And it starts out last week, Nick Goulis had everything a wrestling promoter could ask for the Mid-South Coliseum, a Saturday morning TV show, and Jerry Lawler. Memphis Wrestling owned by Goulis, Roy Welch, and Bert Bates. And I think Bert was sort of the front man, is that right, or the local quote-unquote promoter? Now, here's the thing there. You had in Tennessee, the promoter with the license had to live in the city they were promoting. So that's why... Burt Bates and then his son Guy Bates later on after Mr. Bates got, you know, not unhealthy and older and not able to do it. Well, they were the only wrestling show in town. Beginning today, I guess, of course, this is March 20th, 1977. Beginning today, there will be two pro wrestling shows in Memphis. Ghoulis Monday Night Show at the Coliseum and Jerry Jarrett's Sunday Night Production at the Cook Convention Center. Both sides are prepared for war. It is a matter of who the public is going to support, says Goulis, a Nashville-based promoter who has been in the business for 42 years. Quote, I may go down, but there will be fighting all the way. It's a matter of years of the uh, SU years is striking out on his own. Since resigning from Memphis Wrestling Enterprises on February in February, Jarrett had lured most of the Monday night wrestlers, Lawler, Rocky Johnson, Bob Armstrong, Gorgeous George Jr., Jackie Fargo, who, by the way, did not make the move. Phil Hickerson, Dennis Condry, Johnny Walker, Ron and Robert Fuller, Tommy Rich, David Schultz, Dutch Mantel, Bill Dundee, the Von Steigers, Rick and Robert Gibson, Tommy Gilbert, Buddy Diamond, and Porkchop Cash. In addition, package will include studio wrestling years who canceled the ghoulish produced show on Channel 13 for March, in March. Meanwhile, Jerry worked out an agreement with Channel 5 which kicked off its studio wrestling yesterday morning, 9.30 until 11. WMC-TV officials said throughout the spring and summer, the show will air from 11.30 until 1. So it started out as a 90-minute show. So what do you think about that article? And do you remember seeing that, Chris? Did you get the Memphis commercial appeal? No, I did. we did not get the commercial appeal. Uh, for whatever reason, obviously we got the Jonesboro paper back in those days. Uh, I don't remember seeing the article, but I'm obviously very familiar with the history of all this. And and I, when you said that earlier about Lawler, the significance is Lawler, Jarrett got Lawler, and that was the key. That was if absolutely Lawler, the key. Lawler, if Lawler stays with Nick, history has changed forever. It never it never goes over. It never works. It's a failure. And we're, we're having it. We don't, we don't even have this show probably because it dies because he was the key to the whole thing. 
And you said about Jerry Jarrett needed to be in charge to compare to what we were talking about previously. Vince went away and new leadership took over and it's flourishing. Yes. Nick went away. Jerry Jarrett took over and it flourished. He you had, know, the one point about that is that Nick didn't have anything at all to do with the booking of Memphis, Louisville, or Evansville. The only, And once Jerry bought Nick out, he bought Nashville in 1980. A couple of times, I don't know if he tried Birmingham. I think he might have. He did Chattanooga a couple of times. He did. He was happy with the territory he had. He didn't. He didn't try to to run the territory, the entire territory. Nick did, but at the same time, Nick was never running Memphis, Louisville, Evansville, or Lexington. Yeah, yeah, Jerry had been booking it already, but for the you know until after the fact, people like me who were fans watching like you were as a as a kid, you didn't know the behind the scenes workings of it. But then once it split. And Nick went away, it exploded. You know, it really, and, and who knows, it might have otherwise, but without the creativity and the change and, and a lot, you're, you know, Randy West, a lot of his great stuff he did all played a part of that explosion. Yeah, it was a teamwork, no doubt about it. Michael will read some more, but Pat, of what you've heard so far, your comments, and I'll get you on the screen. Well, I mean, I agree. I agree with Chris. And the thing that 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 strikes me as I sit here and li listen, you know, Jerry built, you know, really his own promotion, you know, with with Michael and Hulk Hogan, with you know uh, Randy West, with everything, with opening up Louisville, and you know, he really didn't need what the you know, if yeah, and I, I don't think, and and I talked with Jerry about this at length one time in his backyard. You know, he he never thought about this until what happened. What we'll talk about here in a minute happened, and he could see that you know it that it, it they could lose it all what he had built, and and so you know I don't think I think some people think that this is you know some devious plot on Jerry jerry's part but you know according to him and i believe him, he was perfectly happy with what they had built but you know nick nick made a decision based on you know his his family feelings that jerry thought wasn't in the best interest of business and that's how we got here we'll learn a little bit about that later but um yeah, I agree with everything Chris said and what Michael has said and, and the Memphis Appeal. It's it's interesting to have an article that long and a full page, whether it's front page or not, talking about this. And it just indicates how important wrestling is and always has been to the, to the people of Memphis and the Memphis South. I hope, I hope everybody's enjoying this conversation about the big split of 1977 and again same thing michael we'll put you back on on the screen you can continue with the whatever comments you want to say and then pick a spot and then we'll all come back in for discussion well first of all i, th I think every point that's been made to this point has been very poignant by the panel and uh, the one thing i want to say when this article came out and i was living in memphis and uh, running wmps for the programming of wmps and what became k97 when this article came out, uh, Randy, you are 100% on target. This was an earth-shattering article for the newspaper to print because wrestling had been relegated to the circus section, if you would, excuse the, the pun, but had been relegated to very little ink until this happened. And then all of a sudden, like you said, front page sports section, Memphis Commercial Appeal, almost a million in circulation, 958,000 when this came out earth shattering earth shattering so the, the, keep that in mind and i will say that the writer of this i and i and i thought this when it happened in reading it the past a couple of times over the past couple of days the writer i thought did a good job of showing both sides of the story i don't think he was partial either way but i think as you will hear as we read on that the, the dick became stacked in jerry jarrett's favor not because of anything that he did off record but what he did to bring the talent to his stable. 
And I think that was the difference as what you guys have said. Jarrett says he realizes that he is a new company on a new TV station and realizes that he has a heck of a job in front of him, but he's aware that he has the top talent and in keeping the top talent, people will support it. Jarrett, age 34, who got his start under Goulas Welch, is the son of Miss Christine Jarrett, who has been a Goulas bookkeeper for 30 years. Jarrett was Goulas's matchmaker for the past year. Some management problems developed and they, accumulate, uh, they culminated in Jarrett's resignation. Jarrett, who lives in Hendersonville, Tennessee, said it was a management fight. I lost, so I resigned. After resigning, Jarrett asked regular crew to come with him, offering them a better potential. They owned it. It was just, a, I was just an employee, so I quit. I asked, I got everybody I asked for cause. They know I have been there. I know how hard it is living on the road. Wrestling is a hard life and they need to be paid well. Then it gets into the Jerry Lawler scenario. Lawler, the main event, most Monday nights, will no longer wrestle for Goulas Welch. Lawler says one reason he's wrestling for Jerry Jarrett is that Jerry was a wrestler at one time. He knows more about the problems of wrestlers. Another reason is money. Lawler will make 150000 this year, and he will be paid more than what he was paid with Goulas Welch with Jarrett. Jarrett will be at the Cook Convention Center. Goulas Welch at the, remains at the Coliseum. The Coliseum board told Jarrett that they had an unwritten law of booking back to back similar events. After meeting with the board, Jarrett said he would not seek the gates at the Memphis Mid-South Coliseum. Very interesting, that part of the article. And we'll go real quick back to you, Pat, for your comments on that just remarkable, remarkable story. I know we're dating ourselves, and a lot of you guys don't remember those days pre-1977. It's the era we all greatly remember, no doubt about it. We'll go with Chris first and let him go first with comments on the article. Well, while we I do. think, I mean, the article gives such legitimacy to the sport because it was seen as a sport in this era and it, a lot of credibility and professionalism went into this. The other thing that stands out to me as an adult and I had no idea as a kid, but what I know about Jerry Jarrett reading this book, talking to all of you guys who knew him, <clears throat> I mean, he's really good at money and figuring things up. I think he knew what he was drawn in Memphis and Evansville and so forth already and, and knew quickly that if he could get the right people on board to get a TV, that he was going to be successful. That he wasn't going to worry about Nick anymore. I think, I don't think he was maybe as Pat said, he wasn't looking for the opportunity, but once the opportunity presented itself, he was very confident based on what he already had, that it was going to, it was going to work, especially after he got TV five. Pat? I um, know, you know, it, Michael and Chris are, are spot on with all of that. I mean, you know, with, I, I like this segment so much and their insight because you, you can, you know, we're, de, we're defining what the variables were and how they could all come together. And uh, it's just a matter of how that how that would get done. And apparently this 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 drama played out on the uh on the pages of the Memphis newspaper, and I'm sure in the news too, and in the coffee shops and on Bill Street and everywhere people love uh, Memphis wrestling. No doubt about it. The story is just so fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And we'll go back to Michael. And then after Michael stops, I'll give a couple of comments then we'll go with the rest of the panel for them as we continue this article that appeared in the memphis commercial appeal just a quick note to what pat said living in memphis when this came out and the news broke not only did they have the front page of the sports section they had captured every sports channel or every sports uh during the local news at six and ten they had the lead story in sports on channels three, five, and 13 for a couple of days there. And after the Monday show had to, uh, had to even a, a backup, a follow-up on it, 
So it really did uh, capture the city that had no pro teams. Professional wrestling, as coaches made it very obvious and prominent here on this show in many weeks past, professional wrestling in Memphis was Memphis's professional sport in this day and time. The article continues during the last physical year from July 1, 1975 to June 30th, 1976, wrestling took in $792,649.50 for 50 days. Let's go ahead and read those, read those figures again, Michael, if you would, so people can comprehend that. $792,649.50. So that's almost $800,000 for 50 dates at the Mid-South Coliseum. Promoters had to pay 12.5% of the gate proceeds back to the Coliseum, had a $1,000 minimum a a week on it, but they had to pay 12.5%, take 12.5% out of 800,000, basically, and you've got what the Mid-South Coliseum made. The promoters are required by Tennessee law in that day and time to... uh, make a contribution to a patriotic organization in the ghoulish wrestling territories. It was the American Legion, the average gross during the year at the Madison square garden for wrestling to the American Legion was $15,892. So basically $16,000 of that went to the American Legion. Nicholas says Nashville averages 3,500 or Denver, 7,500 Madison square square garden. $22,000 $22,000 monthly. Now, Nashville averaging 3500 Denver 7500 and Madison Square Garden 22000 monthly. I think that's low. I don't know about the Denver number, but I think that was low at that time on the Nashville number, although the numbers had decreased in the Nashville territory or the Nashville uh, section of the territory by then. Nick Lewis says they have Jerry Jerry. We do not, but I think we've got new guys, new faces, just as good. Now, let me interrupt you. I mistyped, mistyped there. Nick said in his quote, they have Jerry Lawler, not Jerry Jerry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, they have Jerry Lawler. It says, uh, Nick Gullis says they have Jerry Lawler, but we we do not. But I think we have new guys, new faces, just as good. Clay Conrad will be the WMC TV announcer replacing Lance Russell and Dave Brown. And that, uh, uh, excuse my French, shit the bed. Uh, Nick Gula says he is pushing for a show on WREG Channel 3, who says they do not have an available time slot. Gula says that if he does not get on TV, we are going to have to work 10 times harder to keep people coming. Well, we all know what happened after that. End of article. Very interesting article, and thank you so much, Michael St. John. That was was great stuff, and, uh, you know, I said I would come back on, and I would comment on, on that, and, you know, I just living it and being a part of that as a ring announcer in Jonesboro, Arkansas, you know, we never saw Nick Ulis. We never saw Roy Welch. We didn't see... In Jonesboro, Jerry Jarrett, except three or four times a year, unless he was wrestling. Now, if he was involved in a main event program, then he would be there every week. The big changes for us, and it's what Chris will speak to that Saturday morning, and I had forgot about this, to that article, a regular time slot on Channel 13 that aired that program for 17 years was at 11 o'clock. The premiere date, absolutely the premiere date for Channel 5 wrestling was going to be, or the time period was going to be at 9.30 to 11. Yeah, 9.30 to 11. And then the regular time period would be from 11.30 to 1.00. They did that a few months after baseball season, I think, and then it ended up where they they would uh, come back and go to the traditional 11 to 12.30. We'll get Chris because Chris was just like me, except I had a little heads up on this, and I knew it was changing. I didn't have to search. I got the inside word 
uh, from Eddie Marlin and um, didn't really know the change of the ownership. So I don't know if I, well, I, certainly on the TV show, I heard the Nick Goulas name, but I knew that at that point in my life, in 1977, I knew Jerry Jarrett was the boss and Eddie Marlin was the local promoter. The day, the D-Day, the day it all changed. One Saturday morning, it wasn't on Channel 5. It was all of a sudden, or it wasn't on Channel 13. All of a sudden, it was on Channel 5. Your thoughts? Well, in today's world, people would probably ask, how did you find out it was on Channel 5? When I turned on, thir you know, when I turned it on and it wasn't on the normal channel, there was only three other options. So I found it on Channel 5, but as, as I've talked about on this show many times, the biggest shock for a kid who watched it every week was Lance and Dave were on there and Clay Conrad and Bob Young were on there. And I've made reference to that. I laugh every time I think about it because they were so uncap uh, incapable of being wrestling announcers because they had no, uh, you know, they might be sportscasters, it's different than being a wrestling announcer. And even to a, I was 10 years old when this happened and I could see it like yesterday. And of course, you know, Lawler comes out and says, hello, ugly. Talk about Clay Conrad. How's you know, he says, how's, how's it going? And Clay Conrad said, I've been better. And my thoughts as an adult are Clay thought that when he picked up the microphone and started trying to call a wrestling match, he thought, what the hell am I doing out here? I don't know anything about this because that's the way he came across. And I'm sure he was a good guy and a great professional. I have no idea. But he knew, and all the wrestlers knew, and the fans, even though I was a dumb kid, I'm like, what in the crap, you know? And, and of course, in a few weeks, Lance was back and all was right with the world. But that was a shock. Like, you turn it on, you're like, what am I watching? Like, what? what is this? One of the things, a couple of funny things, and I don't know if Pat, I'm sure Chris probably remembers this. I don't know, Pat or Michael, you were living in Memphis at the time, but a couple of different things. The co-host was Bob Young. I believe he was a radio guy. Speak of that. Was Bob a radio guy? And do you know what station, Michael? Yeah, he was on 790 WMC AM at the time. Two different things, two different stories, and then that's when they really went heavy and offered a lot of money to Lance Russell. And we'll tell the story why Lance didn't go in the first place in a minute. But a couple of things that really made Jerry Jarrett a nervous wreck, and I'm surprised Jerry Jarrett didn't shoot somebody because this is when the business was protected. And Bob Young, in the middle of the – match and he said oh man what a fake looking kick that was and everybody in the dressing room back in those days you can just imagine michael absolutely imagine other thing that happened was a match was supposed to go 10 minute broadway or a 10 minute draw go through 10 minutes and and it was back then you know there wasn't ifbs or anything thing like that that and and uh all of a sudden it was 12 minutes in 13 minutes in and jerry jerry told eddie marlin said well the time limits expired go out out and so eddie went and kind of uh took the microphone away from him and said well, the time limit's over and this is a clay conrad deal he said eddie said the time limit's over why aren't you ringing the bell he said, because it's such a good match, I want to see who the winner is. <laughs> I've never heard that story, but that's so hilarious. They didn't smarten them up then. Absolutely right? not. No, they did not no. smarten them up. No. Pat, you, what do you think of all this mess we're talking about now? Well, I mean, I think I'd like to see the end of it, too, if it was a good match. I mean, I can't, can't blame the guy. But, you know, I mean, a couple things that hit, struck my mind. Michael, who who is probably the uh, and, and you know we we won't debate this, but I mean who who's the greatest sports announcer ever? I mean, let's let's of throw any a sports of yeah. any baseball, basketball. I yeah, mean, he just, he just what led, legends. Okay, he, Keith he, Jack, Keith Jackson, Jackson in college football. Howard Cosell, um, uh, Vin Scully. Uh, you know, throw throw them all out there. 
none of those guys, none of those guys ever were going to follow Lance Russell in Memphis. So it doesn't it's matter who they point. put out there. They, that's, they could have, that's a good point. They could have put Chris and I up there in clown suits, or they could have put Ben Scully and Cosell up there, and we would have both not got over the same way. Hey, Randy, I want to add something real quick. Okay, we'll put you on. This is for the younger, for the younger crowd. When I talk about they didn't smarten them up, me and R.H. have been friends since I was about 13 years old. And I can tell you, he didn't smarten me up till I was an adult. He worked for him back then, and he never. Hey, I, I didn't agree with that 100% of what you just said. And let me clear. But I okay. never smartened you up. The no, world no. smartened you up. I yeah. never did. I agree with that. But I'm saying the reason, to tell you how protected it was back then, the reason they didn't tell Bob Young and Clay Conrad as good of friends as Randy and I were, I was never told anything about it, and we never had any discussion till I was probably in my 30s, RH, just to tell uh, the younger people that didn't understand that back then how it was. Let me interrupt a saying, a longtime viewer, Greg Campbell, has been having health issues and about to get, the, get kicked out of his apartment, and there's a GoFundMe out there and so it's on the screen now is gofundme.me slash f4e38f9d his name is greg campbell and it's a go fund me so if you guys i just wanted uh greg had asked yesterday in the last night show but i didn't see the comment but i saw it today scott's art is saying great stuff guys and so this is very very interesting show and one thing and and if i say something wrong and i we're going it's hard to turn back the the clock and we're going to play what if and we'll go with all three of you guys after i make this statement so channel 13 didn't want to get involved in a legal mess then lance russell was an employee of channel 13. Jerry Jarrett went and got channel five, then went to channel 13 and told them, well, they went to channel 13 and he tried to get channel 13. He said, no, we have a contract. And then they pretty much got a bad smell and, and a taste in their mouth, whatever you want to say it about wrestling. So they absolutely they canceled wrestling right there. So this is the what if. Are you ready for it, Mike? Yes, sir. The what if question is this? The Channel 13 show was established, right? The time period, right. the channel, right. the whole nine yards. What would have happened if Channel 13 would have kept wrestling, would have kept Lance Russell and Dave Brown, but would have lost Jerry Jarrett as the booker? would have lost Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee and Rocky Johnson and Hickerson and Condry, and we can go on and on and on and on and on. I think the uh, one-month takeover by Jarrett would have been elongated, but in the long run, I think Jerry would have prevailed, uh, perhaps with a different announcer from a different era or a different town uh, to come in and do the show. But I think in the long run, inevitably, uh, I think Jerry would have won the war, but because he was able to get Lance and remember Lance resigned a very good, secure program director's job at WHBQ TV channel 13 with benefits. He, absolutely. He, he had a great deal there and he left and he couldn't reveal right away about going to Jarrett. But as I understood it and, and had been told that the plan was, there was a master plan in place. When Jerry, once Jerry Jarrett quit Nick Gula, so once he found out that he had bought quote unquote options instead of stock in the company, he started working behind the scenes clandestinely and got everything, got all of his ducks in a row. And then the split happened. And that's, uh, I don't think this was a, a situation where Jerry walked in one day and said, okay, I'm going to create a new Memphis wrestling company. I think this was in the plans for a while. I think he also had people, i.e. Eddie Marlin in place, his mom in place from what he was doing in Louisville. 
that he just took the Louisville blueprint, put it in Memphis, had great TV in Memphis once he got Channel 5, and got Lance Russell, and then very shortly thereafter, Dave Brown reunited them, and the rest is history. I want to say one thing, though. Uh, WHBQ-TV at the time was owned by RKO General, which was a tire company that had media properties. And uh, if I am, and I'm almost 100% sure of this, the only television station in RKO General's portfolio that aired wrestling in the whole country was channel 13 in Memphis. Yeah, absolutely. You're hundred percent right about that. David Linville with comments, Greg comments, Ronnie in the house. Appreciate it very much. You're welcome. Greg Campbell. Appreciate everybody getting a little education as we go way, way back. We're going to turn the, the show over right now to pat trammell and pat is going to read a few passages from jerry jarrett's book the best of times with mark james and i want to plug mark james just search for mark james books there's a ton of them out there folks and he does a absolutely great great job just just phenomenal just a phenomenal job, and and I'm going as you start your reading. I'm going to read that gra leave that graphic up for a minute. But go ahead, Pat. Well, thank you, Randy. I mean, I think this is this is kind of important because this this is Jerry's own words, and and I'll uh, I'll preface this by saying, you know, he he was clear to me, and this was about three or four five years three or four years before he died. We sat we were working on something together and we were sitting in the backyard talking about it. He said, you know, I know I didn't really ever think about leaving until the following happened. And, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I'm not going to uh, cast aspersions on anybody else in here, but this is just Jerry's take on it. Um, and the, it's chapter 11 betrayal. And we're, you know, at, as we know, Memphis wrestling is basically carrying the territory at this time. So keep that. That's that's the backdrop of what we're we're looking at here. As 1977 started, the gap between the Memphis end of the business and the Birmingham end kept getting bigger. Nick Goulas had raised his only son George with too much love and too little discipline. To put it simply, George Goulas was a spoiled brat. To, to compound the situation, George was not athletic and was extremely uncoordinated. However, Nick insisted that George become a wrestling star. Nick would pay large sums of money for wrestlers to come in and wrestle George. We all shook our heads in amazement when Harley Race, the NWA world champion, was booked against George. The Birmingham end of the business became a big loser. To be honest, I did not mind subsidizing the Birmingham end simply because the Memphis end was so profitable that we were still having huge monthly profits. One day, I walked into the office and Nick called me into his office. Nick advised that the reason the Birmingham end of the business was down was because they needed a change of talent. He said I had a choice between him taking over the Memphis end and me taking over the Birmingham end or me taking George and a few other wrestlers to Memphis and sending him an equal number of my top men. Now, uh, this is not in the book, but uh, Jerry told me that that included Lawler to go to Nashville, uh, to Birmingham. I told Nick that I would do neither and that all he needed to do was to find George another occupation. I told him that we had worked too hard to kill the Memphis end with either George or his promotion. Nick informed me that I did, not, that I did not have a choice in the matter. 
I reminded Nick that I did not work for him and that I owned as much of the business as he did. Nick then told me that I, that I did not own any part of the business and that I should call Cecil Brandstetter and he would explain the situation. A cold chill ran down my back, and instantly I realized that I had allowed Nick's lawyers to draw the contract between us and had not gotten my own attorney to look after my interest. Now, uh, I, you know, I, this, is, this is one part of this, but to, to put it in perspective, and Michael touched on this, Jerry had paid $50,000 uh, out of his earnings for an ownership percentage of the overall promotion. And my understanding was that was that was a 10% 10 percent um, interest. Now bear in mind, Jerry was running at the time uh, and had started running, had built basically from scratch, um, the Jonesboro Territory, Tupelo, um, which were, I think, every other week towns. And I think Jonesboro may have been weekly towns. Randy and Chris would know better, certainly. But had, had built Louisville from nothing. And, and Louisville was, I think, the second drawing his town in the, in the promotion, along with Evansville, Indiana. So it was much larger than just Memphis. Um, I called Cecil, Cecil Brandstetter. Cecil advised that all I had bought for my $50,000 was an option to buy, and that option had long ago expired. I hung up the phone and walked into Nick's office to confront him. I said, Nick, you own it all. You have screwed me, and I have no one to blame except myself. I trusted you, and that was a mistake. I walked out of his office with my head spinning. I gathered up a few personal items from my desk, and my mother walked in and asked what I wanted her to do. I told her to just sit tight until I figured out what to do. I walked back into Nick's office, and he was huddled with George. I said, Nick, there's one important thing you have overlooked. The wrestling business is only in someone's brain and you and Cecil can't take that. I can buy rings and belts, and that is really all I'm leaving here. You'll live to regret this day. I promise you that. I will be back in the business, and you and your son will be out of the business. Um, I went home and informed Deborah, that's his wife and Eddie Marlin's daughter, that I not only did not own a business, that I did not have a job. I'll forever be grateful for her support during this most trying time. Deborah simply said, we will make it and this will someday be a blessing. You're too smart to let Nick get you down. Her words turned out to be prophetic, but they were of little comfort at the time. We both went into a state of depression for a few days. We would both sit on the couch and cry ourselves to sleep and wake up aching from sleeping on the couch. One morning, I got up and walked down to my dock, boat dock. It was a glorious day. The early sunrise over the lake seemed to wash my mind, and more, it washed my soul. I felt a great weight lifted, lift from my chest, and my hate for Nick and George was replaced with sympathy. My three days of darkness made the sun brighten my spirits, and it also made me truly believe the words I had said to Nick. All I'm leaving behind is a few wrestling rings and some belts. I began to work day and night on my plan to go into business for myself. I called Eddie Marlin and told him to test the waters to determine if Nick planned to fire him too. Eddie called back and advised that his conversation with Nick was crazy. He advised that Nick told him that he knew Eddie would not let the fact that his son-in-law was nuts affect his livelihood. And was Nick was counting on Eddie to run Memphis for a few weeks until Nick could get organized. Um, I then contacted the wrestlers and told them that I would open a business in a few weeks and anyone who wanted to work for me was welcome. And I would understand if someone did not want to take the risk with a new promotion and instead wanted to stay with Nick. Every single wrestler told me to just tell them what to do and they would do it. 
I advise them to take directions from Eddie Marlin and work as hard as possible to keep the business good. I then called my friend Eddie Graham, who was the Florida promoter and extremely influential in the NWA, to see if he would support me. Eddie said he was offended that I would even ask. He suggested that I make some kind of deal with Buddy Fuller because that would help with the NWA politics because of Roy's previous ownership. I called Buddy and made a deal for him for with him for ownership in my new promotion. And he also speaks about uh, Burt Bates, and and Burt was supportive as well. What was Burt Bates's business in Memphis, Randy? Do you know? I I can't hear Randy. I don't it, know if it's me. Can you hear Randy, Pat? I, I can't hear. I can't, I can't hear, hear Randy either. Well, look, to answer your question, he, he was the partner. Uh, I'll read you a little bit about Burt Bates while Randy's working on the. on the. Uh, I'm basketball. good now. I'm good now, but go ahead and read that. Okay, because he has an interesting background. Uh, as the deal is being made, I made a visit to someone I considered a friend, Burt Bates. And as Randy, I believe, told us, you had to have someone who lived in the town to have a wrestling license. And Bert was the local technical promoter. Randy, is that right? Yes. Okay. Bert was a Memphis partner of Nick Glulis and Roy Welch when Roy first gave me the job as booker and producer at Memphis Television. Bert was a politically powerful man in Memphis at the time. Roy Welch told me he was a holdover from the E.H. Crump era of Memphis politics. If you enjoy history, a little research on E.H. Crump is most fascinating. Burt was so powerful, in fact, that in the aftermath of the Martin Luther King 1968 assassination, when Memphis was basically locked down, our ma matches continued to run and without in incident. So wow. that, that's Jerry's story of, of how, you know, how this all developed and how he ultimately started his own promotion. Very interesting, Pat, and thank you so much. Now, your microphone's still hot. Is that all you wanted to read? I think that's, yeah, I think that's a good stopping point. So let's go with, uh, with Chris and Michael on uh, his reaction to that article that Pat, and we have about 45 minutes left in the show. This may be a two-parter here today, but Pat or Chris, real quick reaction to that article or from the, the, from the book, Best of Times. Well, I think it's interesting that, that Miss Jarrett asked him what to do. And he kept, apparently she kept her job with Nick temporarily. And he, he used Eddie in that manner to stay in touch with the boys during the same time because blood's thicker than water. And that's family. So, fa you know, J Nick screwed up over family and Jerry helped had family assist him in the separation. The other interesting thing to me is the, the fullers and the well, you know, the, another irony, the bloodline now is being used in WWE, the, the history of professional wrestling the bloodline, if I'm not mistaken, runs through the Welches. So Jerry Jarrett got Buddy Fuller, may have been primarily in name only, but that gave him a lot of power, in my opinion, because obviously that's Ron Fuller and Robert's dad and so forth. But between Eddie Graham and having that bloodline of the Welch family in support of him gave him another leg up on being successful. That is for sure. And I might – Let's say this that Roy Roy Welch and I want to look at my notes to make sure I get this uh, right because this is uh, this is very important and I'll put myself center uh, thing and and I'll oh, it's not on that page, folks. You'll see the back of my head there, but. Uh, that's okay as we look here. Nick Goulas, let's talk about the whole crew. Nick Goulas was born on September 3rd, 2014, died 
January the 21st, 1991, at age 76. Roy Welch was born in 1901. He passed away in 77. I thought that was very interesting. That was the Gulas Welch. Jerry Jarrett passed away February 14th of last year at 80 years old. Michael, we uh, read, uh, we heard from Chris about his thoughts on the book and Jerry Jarrett's writing about the split. So, uh, so your thoughts. Well, I think the book was telltale is exactly what happened. I, I think Jerry was right on with, with what he had to say and what he put in his book. I think he was probably a little, uh, uh, I think he was probably a little soft on what he was thinking and feeling at that time. But I think the history, the, the timeline of the history is correct. And speaking of the bloodline of the Welches and, and Randy, was not Christine Jarrett kin to the Welches family or, or, the, or that, that bloodline in some way? Was, was it her sister married a Welch? Or, it seems like there was some connection between the Welch bloodline, the family, and Christine Jarrett, i.e., then Jerry Jarrett. No, there there was not there was not a official thing, and we see Joshua having a good time. I'm sorry, I had to break up on that. He's he got my LSU flag from behind me that my daughter gave me, and he puts it over his head, and I don't know what he's doing. I'm sorry, guys. Continue your thoughts. Well, no, I, I, for some reason, I thought there was a blood connection, but I guess there was not. But, you know, the fact of the matter is that 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 was a stroke of genius, in my opinion, getting Buddy Fuller involved. And I think taking the advice of Eddie Graham, who I think to this day everybody respects as one of the greatest territorial promoter in the history of the wrestling business, I think there was a very, very good uh, – I think, think that was a very good uh, – uh, there, there was a very good – Good point made. Interesting. Uh, a rumor uh, was Jerry was Roy's illegitimate son. I had I have never heard that before, but I'm I'm sure at that time there were tons of rumors flying on both sides of that that fence. Yeah, some of the old timers, and Pat or Frank Morrell was one of them. He really thought that as well. I knew Eddie Marlin didn't think that. Jeff didn't think that. Uh, I didn't mean for that to go on air. I just write that as a private chat, but there it is. I'm sure people have probably seen that before, that rumor, and I don't think that that is true at all. And do you remember, because I think it's just two years, maybe three, maybe three, three or three and a half, that Buddy Fuller, real name Edward Welch, Roy Welch's son, was – partners with Jerry Jarrett, and then they had a big falling out and went away. Do you know much about that? I, all I know is I know in Knoxville, this was about the same time that Ron Fuller opened up Knoxville on Dave Galuzzo's, uh, Galuzzo's uh, territory and was running the Knoxville. And, and I, I'll tell you who probably knows more about that than I do is Bo James. And, and how Ron Fuller got a hold of that Knoxville territory. In 1974. Was that so? So that was prior to this, I guess. Yeah. But uh, uh, you know, that, that that's a good point. But the Fullers, I know at the at the end, there wasn't bad blood, or at least when I was involved and before Jerry dissipated from the company. And uh, I, I know that Jerry Jerry had gotten back in good graces with Robert and Ron because they were sharing talent. They were going back and forth with. You know, Robert came in. Well, heck, Robert came into the territory to book. Not a successful booking operation, but he came in to book. But uh, I think that all sort of got worked out. And I think Buddy Fuller was that. A, with the, did the falling out, Randy, occur about the time Buddy Fuller bought the uh, the Mars Ranch down in Giles County, Tennessee? The the guy that started the uh, yeah, well, be, what became M and M Mars Corporation, Mars Candy Company, had this fabulous horse farm. Uh, just uh, west of Pulaski, and uh, and Buddy Fuller bought it, and uh, I was for seeing for some reason I think something all the transpired. Buddy needed some collateral, Jerry, and then that all sort of blew up about the same time that Buddy Fuller bought the the Mars Ranch family or the Mars uh, horse ranch. 
one of the things I'll add to that is that after Buddy Fuller died, Ron Fuller and and uh, Ron Fuller went together with Buddy Fuller's wife, not Ron Fuller's mother, but his wife at, at a time who later married uh, um, Don Wright, as a matter of fact. So keep it all in, in the crew. But they ended up selling or suing Jerry Jarrett. And Jerry Jarrett, uh, they, they were accusing him of not paying the correct dividends. And, and Jerry Jarrett had to write a six-figure check if memory serves me correct. Did you ever hear that, Michael? Uh, I knew that there was some court action, but I never heard of a settlement. Very, very interesting. I think right now we're going to switch gears because we have been talking for a, a long time without any action. And I like to, on this show, mix action, uh, if I can, with, with great talk. And I commend... Pat and Chris and Michael for doing just a, a great job. And it worked out good for me because the problem is with me, with my, with Adam Dunn not here, I'm having con to concentrate on a computer that I haven't messed with at all. And Bo James has the comment. And so, so Mr. Know-it-all says, Buddy Fuller, Bought the ranch in 75, I think. The fallout was over Ohio. That's right. When Buddy uh, when Buddy came in, and uh, I think that might have been in 86 or 87, and opened up. No, it would have been earlier than that, as a matter of fact. But there were, uh, and the court settlement was was 88 in in that area but was so, that before but was that before ron fuller had the hockey team or did ron have enough juice in cincinnati and dayton to get tv i i don't think ron I, if anything ron had the hockey, hockey team in nashville because if you remember that's where he started okay he had the cincinnati cyclones also they in fact made a but, but a not at the game. same time right i think he had cincinnati first no, I know for sure he had Nashville first. He had Nashville, okay. okay. Yeah, because I'm a loyal viewer of Ron's podcast that that is just absolutely fantastic. I just wanted to set up, we're talking a lot about 1977. The territory was in great shape in 1976. Gullis and Welch owned it. Jerry Jarrett was the brains behind it. And we wanted to just take a look at some Mid-South Coliseum footage. And I'm... Our microphones will not be hot in this video, but this is a very young Tommy Rich. About, let me think, he debuted in 75 in January. 1976, he was in a main event program with Jerry Lawler, and we'll take a look at that right now. Ferguson warning him. 
And the youngster wobbling around the ring as Lawler really has him in serious trouble. He measures him and throttles him. Lifters Rich. And Lawler bangs away at him. Shakes his fist to Jackie Fargo. Reminding Fargo of the night that Lawler cracked the ribs of Fargo and put him in the hospital. Lawler, all the confidence in the world, as he always has, becoming obnoxious with it as he taunts Jackie Fargo and continues to slam Tommy Rich around the ring. Rich. We passed the nine minute mark. We'll make that the 12 minute mark. And Tommy Rich in serious trouble. He's bleeding very heavily. Almost goes out between the ropes. Lawler gives him a hand, pushes him down. The referee starts to count on him. As Rich is outside the ropes, Rich down on the floor. Tommy was very long on courage. On the floor, breathing heavily. The referee starts to count only because of the conversation of Lawler. It may have helped Tommy Rich to another six, five or six seconds outside the ring. Rich may not make it back in. The referee walks over, but Lawler comes in behind him and clips Rich down on the ring, on the floor. Rich bounced very hard on the concrete. Mm. Lawler takes Rich inside the ring with a suplex and really splatted him all over. Fargo, up out of his seat, came to the steps. Lawler came up off of Rich. That may have saved Tommy Rich from a three count. Ooh. Down goes Rich again. Tommy picked up by Lawler, whipped into the rope, the big elbow, and Rich goes down. There's another. Lawler comes up off of Rich as Jackie Fargo came to the ring apron. Referee Dave Ferguson warning him. Lawler technically has not interfered with a match, although in the truest sense he's distracted Lawler in two occasions from pinning Tommy Rich. A big body slam. And Lawler goes for a cover. Not even a one count when Lawler comes up as Jackie Fargo leaves his seat. Ooh, Rich is a mess. Lawler pounding on him. Picks him up. Suplex. Takes him over and down. Goes for the cover. Here comes Fargo, and once again, Lawler comes up, hollers out at Fargo. Come on in the ring. Lawler hollering at Fargo to come in the ring and stop all the horsing around that he's ready for him. Referee Dave Ferguson trying to get Jackie Fargo back in his seat. Jackie had a ticket stub for the first throw. Tommy Rich catches Lawler from behind, pulls him into a jet gun. Tommy Rich has upset Gary Lawler for the NWA Southern Heavyweight Championship. Fargo jerks Rich out of the ring. The three down, and Rich is the new Southern Heavyweight Champion, Jackie Fargo, laughing at Jerry Lawler, as Fargo helped Rich.
Rich out of the ring, and Tommy Rich in very bad shape. Though the possessor of the Southern Heavyweight title, Lawler, having a fit in the center of the ring. Trying to get Fargo back in the ring as Fargo holds the hand up. This is Talking Memphis Wrestling as we are doing a deep dive in the big split of 1977. Less than 30 minutes left in the show. Want to do a timeline right now. Jerry Jarrett resigned from Gulas Welch Wrestling, Memphis Wrestling Enterprises on March, on February the 14th of 1977. He then was told Channel 13 was going to cancel wrestling completely. That last date was March the 12th of 1977. The first TV move to Channel 5 WMC TV was on March the 19th, 1977. Now, on Sunday, March the 20th, was Jerry Jarrett's first card in Memphis. As we heard from Pat's reading and from the newspaper article, that Jerry Jarrett wasn't able to run the mid South Coliseum. So down by the Mississippi River, in the former place of Ellis Auditorium, the original home of wrestling in Memphis was Cook Convention Center. His debut card was March the 20th of the year 1977. So as we set that, that up, we will get our buddy Chris Ellis on the show on the screen and he is going to read the Sunday night Cook Convention Center card that drew 9,000 people. This is Jerry Jarrett's first card. The day before on the 19th was his first TV show and Chris will read you the card right now. At the opening match was Rick and Robert Gibson and Jerry Bryant against Dr. Frank, the Mummy, and Private Buddy Diamond in a six-man tag. The second match was Mr. Wrestling 2 against Port Chop Cash. Then the Southern Tag Title match, Hickerson and Condry, which I, they were the Bicentennial Kings then, I think, against Gorgeous George Jr. and Tommy Gilbert. Then the Southeastern Tag Team champ, uh, Championship match, the Von Steigers against Tommy Rich and Bill Dundee. Uh, the next match was Ron and Robert Fuller against Dutch Mantel and David Schultz. Then the Southern title match, Rocky Soul Man Johnson against Plowboy Frazier. And the, and the main event, the stretcher match between the King and Bullet Bob Armstrong. Very interesting first card, and we'll talk about both cards together. Do the Mid-South Coliseum card, a ghoulish well show now, the – Jerry Jarrett card did almost 9,000. It's actually 8,900 people. That was on a Sunday. He had TV on a Saturday. Nick Goulas's card was on a Monday without TV. And we will go ahead and say that the attendance there was 1,900 and 64 people. The Goulas Welch card on Monday, March the 21st. Go ahead and let us know that. All right, the opening match was Tony Marino against Leon Chandler. I never heard of either one of those. Uh, Miss Cora Combs versus the Satan Lady in a ladies match. The third match was Tojo and George Goulas against the Crimson Terrors. The fourth match was the Bounty Hunters versus Chief Thundercloud and Danny Little Bear. And the main event for the U.S. title was Bobo Brazil versus the original Sheik. Okay, that's very good. And we will read in a little bit, but we will break away from that as we will give everybody the information. So that card was on March the 21st. It drew 1964. The next week, Nick drew, drew 1,599. The next week, 1148, then 1474. And his last Goulas card in Memphis 
with no TV again, May 9th, 77, the end of the war, drew 484 people in the 12,000 seat Mid-South Coliseum. Your thoughts about those two cards. Jarrett's first Jarrett Wrestling Company is why he started his, later on, he changed it to Jarrett Welch Wrestling. Then after that, it was Jarrett Promotions. So your comments, Michael San John, on those first two cards of the big sport of 77. I think it's very prominent that that the talent that the fans were familiar with were in Jerry Jarrett's camp. And a lot of the talent, even though there was some good talent on the card with Nick, he was he'd ask uh, the Sheik, he'd ask them to come down and help him out. And he brought, of course, Bobo Brazil, which is a was a national feud that everybody was aware of. But the people in Memphis didn't care about Bobo Brazil or the Sheik. They cared about Jerry Lawler. And I think it's just a mismatch because the local talent that had been exposed on television were with Jerry Jarrett, whereas Nick Goulas, without television, even though he was bringing in some national talent, couldn't sell butterflies. I think that's a good point. Pat, probably the first time you've heard those cards in your life. Your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think I saw them this afternoon for the first time, but I, I'll tell you something that, that – I, I think I've got a little bit of a, uh, Greg, I think I've got a little bit of a, uh, of a unique perception because I, I, I fell in love with wrestling, with Nick Goulas wrestling and wrestling style. But as I've, as I've gotten older and, and, you know, began to watch Memphis wrestling, particularly of that era, the the difference, the difference is striking. And I wish, <clears throat> I wish everybody could get two TVs and watch a year's worth of, of Birmingham and a year's worth of Memphis. And let me say this. I love Birmingham. I love Sterling Brewer. He's no Lance Russell, but he was great. But the way Jerry Jarrett put on wrestling um, is the difference. And, and I don't mean this. I don't mean this to denigrate the Birmingham uh, Goulas Welch. The Goulas Welch is a is a circus act, and the Memphis wrestling is a Broadway play. It's storytelling. It it's not just it it's not just pops. It's not just a fight for that week and then you move on. It evolves. It's personal. It's very personal. Uh, you know, people are in and out of it, and and you, you know, as Michael said, those wrestlers and those storylines went with Jerry, and it continued on. And you can fill up a you can fill up a wrestling you know card with you know, and the Sheik was a big deal, and Bobo Brazil was a big national deal, as Michael says, but there's no backstory to them. So you're seeing an exhibition, and you're part of the soap opera of Memphis wrestling and part of the story. Now, the Sheik and Bobo Brazil both sold out the Mid-South Coliseum in the past with Jerry Lawler. Mm -hmm. But the people of Memphis, Tennessee, didn't know that huge, huge feud in Detroit and Chicago and every place they went that drew mega money. The fans of Memphis, Tennessee could have cared less. And I actually think doing 1,600 people without TV, with just a newspaper ad, I don't think that's bad. I'm sure Nick thought it was bad. It's probably lost money. Bo has a couple of questions. He said, did Jarrett run Louisville and Evansville the month between his resignation and Channel 5 starting? Jarrett didn't run it. Christine ran it. And Nick thought, Eddie was booking the cards, but Jerry Jarrett was booking it and just giving it just like he was writing the television, booking the TV, and then he would either give the TV to Lawler or to to Eddie to run. So, so Jerry Jarrett in those two or three weeks never quit booking. He was just not around, and Nick thought that that he did quit. So, a couple of more notes as we're in the last leg of. 
this show. We'll do a part two because we have two other videos I think you'll be interested in. We don't have time for it today. Now, Lance Russell, the great Lance Russell, returned to television on April the 23rd, 1977. He came back one day before with raised prices, the highest ticket prices ever for pro wrestling in Memphis, Tennessee. I think it was a $25 ringside seat in 1977. The first Jarrett Coliseum card was April the 24th, 1977, drawing actually 8693, 8,693 people. And here's Chris Ellis to read you that card, the debut Jerry Jarrett event, and he would run almost every Monday night for 20 years. Chris? All right, the opening match was Gorgeous George Jr. and Rick and Robert Gibson against Pat McGinnis, Ken Dillinger, and Jim Dalton. Uh, the second match was Paul Orndorff against the Gladiator. Then uh, Robert Ron Fuller versus the Executioners. Southeastern Tag Team Championship match, Tommy Rich and Bill Dundee versus Pork Chop Cash and Norvell Austin. Uh, the fifth match, I've got, I don't know which Graham it was, and Kevin Sullivan against Dr. D, David Schultz, and Bob Orton Jr. Mike Graham. Was it Mike Graham? Okay. Yeah. Uh, Southern Tag Match, Tommy Gilbert and American Dream Dusty Rhodes versus Phil Hickerson and Dennis Condry. Southern Title Match, I mean, they, they pulled out all the stops here. Southern Title Match, The King versus Jack Briscoe. And then the NWA World Title Match, The Greatest Wrestler on God's Green Earth, Harley Race versus Rocky the Soul Man Johnson. Wouldn't you love to see that match right now if oh. both of those men were in their prime? Oh, yeah. What a, what a card. And by the way, just be, just what, and not to interrupt, but on Pat's or on. Uh, well, it's your turn. It's your turn. Well, I'm just saying uh, what Coach was just saying, the biggest thing he just read was that last match with Rocky Johnson and Harley Race. Rocky was in the territory. He had a program going with Lawler. But that was the tip of the iceberg. That was the, well, I should say the linchpin. The, the, the straw that broke the camel's back because that signified that Sam Munchnick, the president of the NWA at the NWA office in Clayton, Missouri, was siding with Jerry Jarrett versus Nick Goulas. Because he gave him the championship match. Because he put the champion in Memphis at, at the Mid-South Coliseum for Jerry Jarrett. How and much, was, Michael, let me ask you a quick question. I have two comments. On that, the only NWA promoter that was loyal to Nick was the Sheik in Detroit. That is At true. At the same time, I think Eddie Graham and Jerry Jarrett was so close, and I think Eddie Graham influenced Sam. Well, and, and I had, like I said, back in uh, 1992, I had lunch twice. Well, once it had lunch with Sam, the second time went, went to his condominium in Clayton and, 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 and saw the memorabilia. And Sam told me firsthand that uh, that he and Nick, that Nick would always, always fight for the cheap side when they'd have the meetings in Vegas and all. Nick would always, there'd be a proposal up from the from the promoters to do so-and-so, but if it was going to cost money, Nick vetoed it. He was always against it, whereas he felt like Jerry was the future and the progress of wrestling, and that's why he went. But I think you're absolutely right, Randy. I think Eddie Graham, who was... Sam's number one promoter in the territories nationwide yes. at that time. Sam was listening to Eddie. And I think Eddie, Eddie was once Eddie went with Jerry Jarrett, then there was no question that Harley races next tour in the mid South was going to be in Memphis with Jerry Jarrett. And this match ended up being Rocky and Harley. Bo James asks is was Lynn Rossi, the booker for Nick then and in 1977, who else would it have been? Because Tom didn't come Ernesto. in to 78. I thought Tom didn't come in to 78. Was Tom there in 77? Yeah, I started with Nick in, in February of 77, and Renesto was booking. All right. In fact, when Renesto was doing TV, 
and Nick wanted to use Ernesto in a in a in an angle they are and I think I think to be honest with you Tom wanted to be in back in the ring so that's when I got thrown into the play by play chair at the at the um, uh, women's building at the fairgrounds the second week I attended as the quote unquote ring announcer all of a sudden Tom gets attacked on TV I was not smart enough to it he threw me the microphone and said, kid, you got to finish this. He got in the ring, got juice, the whole thing. And then it was after that, that Nick pulled me aside in the, in the dressing room. And he said, listen, he said, I wanted that to happen, that you didn't know what was happening. He says, but I'm going to tell you something. If you ever tell it to anybody, I am going to kill you. And that was his exact words. And I never said a word of it until k went away. Pat, what did you think? Pat, what did you think about those parts? Well, I mean, I, you know, Michael makes a very good point. He, he you know, uh, uh, that that kind of ended it from an NWA standpoint. And you, you know, Jim Jim Cornette made a, and you know, it, it's it's sad because they had a great business. And you know, I I I have a saying with my children: I don't love you that much. Uh, and, and part of that is, you know, uh, to give you everything. And it's kind of a joke around our house. But, you know, I was <clears throat> with a young guy that works for, for us today. And we we had a hard meeting in, in Texas yesterday with a business owner and his son. It's just not going in the right direction. And, you know, guys get blinded by the children. And, and I, uh, you know, everybody loves the children. And, uh but, you know, Jim Cornette said, and, you know, I think the issue with George blew it all up. Jerry told me that personally. Um, um, and Sean, I think Sean Reedy's on here, and I think Jerry's told him the same thing. But, you know, the um, the if you look at if if you look at any ad and I and I like old memorabilia, if you look at any any ad. And any business card and anything that came out of Goulas Welch promotions, it had NWA stamped on it 15 ways to Sunday. And and Nick never said something that he didn't talk about a card about being NWA san sanctioned. And, you know, it's just kind of sad that it all had to come down that way. And it's the way you treat people. And a lot of people perceive Nick in a certain way. People like Michael St. John had experiences complete final thoughts to wrap it up tell us what you thought about this show today this period of time in 1977 and this will be part one next week we'll do part two and then first part of the show next week part two of the battle of memphis the big split and the second part of next week's show we'll do modern wrestling we'll preview WrestleMania. It's coming, folks, the 6th and 7th of April. Here's Chris to not only have his final thoughts, he will also tell you what he thought about this mess we had today and what he thinks. If he thinks we, if can you tell that we look a lot better video than yards? It's a life change situation with the production of this show. Yeah, it's way, it's way better. Better lighting, better production, clear picture, much, much more. I mean, whole completely better. So, up one thousand percent. Man, uh, I wish I could pay Adam. Maybe someday he could get a job doing this kind of work because he's great at it. And we missed him today. Oh, I hadn't learned this computer yet. So I made two or three mistakes, but it hadn't been, tell me the truth. It hadn't been glaring mistakes, has it? No, you did well. The, the two, the two things, I'm going to take a little bit different spin here. Okay. Having been a race promoter and not a wrestling promoter, there's two pieces of, I, I use this in the racing business that I stole from Jackie Fargo. And this proves it today. If you got hundred dollar bills on sale for a nickel and nobody knows it, you're not going to sell any any hundred dollar bills. He said that on a video I saw one time. They couldn't run TV, so Nick couldn't draw a crowd because nobody knew they were having a show. And being in the racing business, if I didn't promote a show, nobody came. So I, that will put you out of business. The other thing is, Jerry Jarrett, I give credit always. I didn't know him like you guys. But money-wise, he was smart. 
Biggest ticket ever in the history of the Mid-South Coliseum, $25. 12.5% of that gate went to who? The Coliseum. Yeah. So he starts off his first night as the renter with the biggest payday they've ever had from wrestling. So they're all in now. That bo that board is all in. Oh, my God. Jarrett just paid us all this money. We love Jerry Jarrett and his company. Brilliant. That was brilliant. Final words, Chris, as we wrap this sucker up. Well, it's great to be back. This is a this subject today is near and dear to my heart. Because like the Blake Shelton song says, Hollywood was fake and wrestling was real. And man, I live and I live this right here from day one. When Clay Conrad and Bob Young, as bad as they sucked, I watched them the first time they were on. And I, I mean, I, it's stored in my memory forever. So it was really a lot of fun to do this today. When Lance came back, Bob Young went away, and Lance did like a show or two with Clay, and then here comes Davey to save the day. And I've talked to Dave Brown today to have discussions with him as we we talked uh, we talked about uh, what he thought at the time and that sort of things. It's it's funny, Chris. Uh, we get so busy at this time of year in school session that you can't come on every week. And I hate that. But again, every time you do come in, we appreciate it. Thanks so much. Hopefully you can come back soon. Well, thank you. I'm, it's always a pleasure to be here. I love you guys. Y'all are great friends. I'm just proud to get to be a small part of it. All right, Chris. Thank you very much. Pat, your thoughts on the show? And final well, comments. Well, I, well, a couple final comments. I think, I, you know, one, I, I've enjoyed this because, as you know, I enjoy history. But but with the new technology, I just have to comment. I never knew what a handsome man Chris Ellis was. <laughs> hey, you're flirting. Is that pro love? <laughs> Is that pro love? Uh, yeah. No, but, I mean, it, it, it has been great. And this is, I do, I do love all you guys. You know that. I just teased it with Chris. But. Uh, you know, I just I have enjoyed so much going back through the history of this with and I'm so thankful every every day of my life with my friendship with Michael St. John. But but on this subject, particularly because he spent a lot of time with Nick and you know with the promotion in Nashville and he understands the players, uh, uh, you know, very well and understands Nick's side of things and how Nick operated and and you know Randy you, you too were around Eddie and so it's just it, it, this is living history of of the thing I love the most and so thank you thank you for coming up with this Randy and I look forward to continuing next week with, with all our friends I appreciate it very much and hopefully you're proud of your investment into making this show what will be the best wrestling related show there is and the good production will add to it thank you pat love you thanks for everything all right love you guys michael st john it is 8 54 we have six minutes i won't take that long i can assure you but first of all i want to say a thank you to pat and a thank you to you randy a thank you to adam for creating this new atmosphere that we have for a set. And I am delighted to see all you guys uh, and to see Randy in a suit. My gosh, it goes back to when we were doing wrestling on Channel 5 the last time I saw you in a suit. But God bless and thank you. I know, Pat, you had a lot to do with this. And you and, and uh, are a dear, dear friend. And Chris, you and I have gotten to be friends over the years. I'm dying for us to do a panel live show somewhere this year. And I don't know if it's Jonesboro, or I don't know if it's the Mid-South Coliseum. It could be Birmingham. Heck, it could be in my backyard for all I care. But I would love for all four of us to be in the same room at the same time with the panel discussion and 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 have an opportunity. And maybe we do a Comic Con together and and get a table and we all sit and do one of uh, one of uh, uh, one of our uh, buddies' uh, Comic Con. Well, not Comic Cons. I forget. We go Wrestle Cons. But uh, I would love to have everybody just come together as a as a family, as we've gotten to be via this vehicle that Randy's put together. We haven't been all together in one room together since Randy's book came out. So I think it's time. And 
that's what I would like to say. As far as the subject matter, I want to thank, uh, there was a, a, a wonderful comment posted, uh, aimed at me from Ronnie Crowder. Thank you, sir, for those kind words. I appreciate that. But I really want to put, put this into perspective. This was huge. It turned the tide. It changed wrestling forever. And it created what we talk about every week here on Memphis wrestling. So talking Memphis wrestling, we're only here because of what happened in 1977. So I'm just going to leave it like that and say a big thank you and great love to all of the folks viewing in tonight and listening in tonight and to Randy. Thank you for allowing me to be part of this. You're a wonderful friend. And just the fact that you would even uh, allow this big mouth to come on your show. I'm, I'm honored. And, and I'm, I, uh, I try to be gracious to my host, but, uh, you do a fabulous job. I've always held you in high esteem and somebody posted that they're going to win the lottery tonight by a wrestling company and put you in charge as a booker. I'm all for that. So, uh, thank you, Randy. And thank you, Pat. And thank you, coach. Thank you guys. Appreciate that very much. What a show on the debut of our new gaming computer. A big old thing here. I'll probably stump my toe and hurt myself, trip over all kinds of wires going all over the place and break my neck. I need to make sure that my family knows, Pat, if something happens to me, that the computer goes to you and then you can decide what to do with it. Maybe you uh, Maybe sell it cheap to Adam because he'll buy it from you for sure. <laughs> Let me unmute your. We okay. can we can replace the computer. We can't replace you. Amen. Oh. <laughs> All right, that's that's funny. Thank you, Pat. This has been a blast, and I want to look at the comments real quick to see what we have. Ahmad, our boy, our man, our buddy. He doesn't come in the house very often because he's a great dad, and we miss Ahmad. Thank you for being here. Reese says, great job. Ronnie says, great show. Everybody had great comments about the show today. I appreciate it. I apologize for any screw-ups that I did make in producing this show. Adam said he'd be a couple of minutes late. We're almost three hours into it, and he hasn't showed up yet, and he's not returning my messages. So do you think, Pat, I might have pissed him off? Well, I hope not, but uh, you did you did fine. I'm sure he'll be back. I hope he's okay. But uh, uh, good to see everybody here today and new friends and old friends, and it was really special. And look forward to the next week. For Chris Ellis, for Michael Sanchez, for Pat Trammell, promote – Normally produced by Adam Plugdon, and so also want to heads up to Randy West, who always gives me great advice of this show and the creation part of it. I'm Randy Hills, and we're out for this edition of Talking Memphis Wrestling. Good night, everybody. Talking Memphis Wrestling with Randy Hills and special guests. 